Yeah, I chose the uh, title because it, at this age, it's, it's been more than one lifetime, I think. Uh, and uh, as you know, I've been with, with the group in Chicago. One of our landmark areas of interest was uh, recirculatory uh, pharmacokinetics. And we're gonna talk about that, but there's more in life that recirculates. And, I want, and we're gonna try to touch on that, like ideas recirculate and people come in, go away and come back. So we're gonna try to cover a little bit of that during the uh, talk. Let's try to get closer to the, I got it. I'm gonna give a trigger warning. There's gonna be a lot of bicycles <laughs> in this talk. This is a lifetime achievement. I get to talk about other things than just science. And this is a picture my wife took uh, a couple of pictures my wife took. I was, this is back when um, bike racing was done in black and white. And, um, and it, when it was what I would call a leisure sport. So somebody who was an amateur could actually have fun doing it. So things started at Northwestern in a beautiful setting on the North Co coast of Chicago. Uh, just to kind of orient you, um, Gonna get closer to this. That's the hospital where we work. That was our laboratory um, that we spent time not far away. And then right next to, right next to that's uh, the part of Lake Michigan where you can sneak away to go swimming. Really beautiful to swim there. So I think all of us in this room have had something that hooked us. How did we get into anesthetic pharmacology? And we're gonna dial this back, kind of do the way back machine thing. And I'm gonna start with what was my hook. So it starts with the bait. Um, so our chair, Dr. Bruner, ha had the senior medical students at Northwestern that were applying to anesthesia residency were strongly encouraged uh, to enroll in clinical um, pharmacokinetic seminar that Art Atkinson taught. And it was also offered to uh, all the pharm uh, pharmacology graduate students. Uh, for my medical school class, um, it was Rod Eckenhoff and me. Um, later, when I was the teaching assistant uh, for the class, it included people that we know here, um, Mark Dershowitz and Evan Karish, um, and also Chris Stock, who eventually became chair at Northwestern. Uh, the class was math intensive. We had a lot of homework. And to do that homework, <laughs> we had <laughs> semi-log graph paper and a calculator. So we didn't have any of the things we have now. So Art took this seminar and really turned it into over the years, um, actually for about the last two decades, this has been the main clinical pharmacology textbook used across the country. And it's really based on our seminar. Uh, it's also offered both in person and online um, uh, by the NIH. I was able to uh, precept a couple of courses at the uh, University of Colorado when it was done online. It had the same tricky, tough homework questions. And true to art's form, in order for you to get through the course, you had to take a, a final exam and you had to score on it. <laughs> so you didn't get your certificate that you had done the course. So this was 19, I would orient you when this was. This is the first year trainee pam uh, pamphlet from 1978. That's when I started my residency. Uh, I was a CA, uh, CB1 that year, and this was the group of mugshots from that year, and uh, that's, <laughs> that's my mugshot with, I like it because it, I had a lot of hair. <laughs> so one of the things I got to do during that clinical base year in 1978 was you could, the anesthesia residents got to pick um, two electives um, that were in the di a division of medicine because it was a medicine uh, first year. 
And clinical pharmacology was technically a division of medicine, so I chose that because I had had the experience there. And it was really, really busy. Um, every day, one of the PIs was doing either an animal experiment or a, a, cl a clinical project. Um, just to give you an idea of how Art's lab approached things, uh, samples were spun and analyzed the day of, I mean, put into the HPLC or GC the day of the study, and we plotted the data that night. Um, Art's motto during that time was that science is the triumph of rigor over reason. If you do the experiment the right way, the results will jump out at you. Um, Mid-month um, during my rotation, an immunology fellow who had just given birth uh, showed up ready to do this planned study where we we're gonna look at uh, theophylline in uh, breast milk. Um, the perception was that asthmatics had jittery babies. And for those of you who don't know what theophylline is, that was the main treatment for asthma <laughs> back in the day. Um, and everyone, as I said, we were doing studies every day. Uh, they said, we're too busy, we can't do it. But somebody pointed out to Art that the time that she might be breastfeeding is limited, you should do this. <laughs> and G. Paul Steck, who is the uh, fellow said, uh, he, and he had also been my uh, intern when I was a uh, third year medical student, said, just let Henthorne do it, he can do this. Uh, there, and, but we didn't have a protocol. Um, so Art told me, we're just gonna follow what we do for um, renal excretion. Just look up, just, and you've done a couple of those in the last two weeks. Just pull out those um, experiments and that's what we'll do. Um, so the way this works is, this, uh, is we, every half hour, we would do a, a urine collection in a person or an animal. Um, and then we'd plot, so we'd measure how much urine was produced. We'd measure the concentration and plot it as an excretion rate at the uh, midpoint of each collection period. So this is what that looks like. And then when you model it, uh, the renal clearance uh, is just the ratio between the plasma concentrations, which we've modeled here, and the uh, urine excretion rates that you did down there. So that's what we did. We set up the protocol in order to get um, milk every half hour. Uh, she would go away and pump and we'd take an aliquot, we'd measure that and we'd measure the volume of milk that she produced. And um, so the next thing was I, by the end of the day, I'd run all the samples, I'd plotted them and it was time to, to model. And I hadn't done much modeling at that time. And uh, Art's lab, um, because Art had been a fellow at the National Cancer Institute with uh, Monis Berman, who was really the, one of the founders of mathematical biology back in the 50s and 60s, had written a program for modeling biologic systems, not specifically drugs, but um, other biologic. Um, and it was, the, the program was SAM. And it had a, a, a manual and the manual was really not helpful much at all. And I'll show you a few things from the forward that are kind of instructive. Uh, first, it states the obvious that it's a modeling program um, to convert data into models, fitting, blah, blah, blah. And then he says here that um, model building is complicated and requires in addition to intuition and speculation, which I thought, okay, I'm in business, I can do that. You need to know uh, mathematical statistical procedures. And I'm going to confess right now that the proof that uh, Talmadge put up and said, well, the, uh, the reviewers at CPNT obviously reviewed this and, and said it was fine, the Thomas Schmieder's work, I was one of the reviewers. 
uh, I waived that part. <laughs> um, so that uh, again, he states right in the in the beginning, it's only uh, a brief description. So you can't go from the manual to what you had to do was either um, uh, go study with Monus at the MCI or find one of his his uh, thoroughly trained pupils, which Art was, and that's where you would learn it. It was hands on. And the other things uh, which we also found out about non-mem is that uh, it probably contains some undetected errors. <laughs> and, and this was written a long time ago. So the other thing I wanted to talk about was the era. So this is my student ID, ID at Northwestern. And I just, it, it has something on there that is very instructive and, or not instructive, but um, demonstrable of the time. And that is, if you wanted to communicate with a computer, you had to have punch cards. So all of our modeling was done with punch cards. You would assemble your deck with, that had information about your model and all of your data. And then you would turn it in at the desk and they'd load it eventually into a um, computer and then you'd come back in an hour or two and see what mistakes you, you had made. So <laughs> that, that was life then. And there, was, there were no monitors, of course, and no keyboards, just punch cards. So I got really frustrated. I, there was no way I could get the model to fit. And um, that, but then I noticed that if I didn't plot excretion rate and just plotted the concentration, there was a, a relationship between the plasma and the milk. And it turns out that Art was wrong. He sent me down the wrong path. Um, the breasts are not kidneys on the chest. Uh, they're, di they're dialysis chambers. So the drug can just go in and out freely back and forth, no big deal. Um, and just to show you that this was patient one, this was the one that I did. They did two more and that was enough to get it published in clinical pharmacology. <laughs> and therapeutics. And just to show you the, the model that I used or came up with uh, was that there's a, just a simple uh, ratio between the plasma and, and the milk. Uh, it's time independent, there's no excretion rate. And um, at that moment, I figured, I felt like I'd made a discovery. I found out how something in the body works um, during that month. It was my discovery, so I signed on the dotted line. I signed up for the fellowship right away. Um, so that was that's what hooked me. And I will say that Art confessed to me uh, several decades later that of all the work that came out of that lab, um, this is the one that got quoted the most because there were so many drugs that needed studying uh, in breast milk. And this was the only, this was the first model. And uh, anyway, that aside. So the next thing to come back as a, um, a physiologic basis. Art's whole thing was trying to understand pharmacokinetics from a physiologic point of view. So you know, given that I was an expert in um, dialysis chambers, uh, we ended up studying. Um, or we'll get back to that, I got, I got ahead. So he was, he had already looked at drugs that freely diffused across um, capillaries that were lipid soluble and went to the whole body. And my project became, uh, let's look at drugs that are restricted to interstitial fluid and only cross uh, capillaries at the porous, the water pores, the holes. And um, this is where Mike Abram comes in. Um, Mike had just joined the Department of Anesthesiology and his assignment was to make sure I was kept in line. And <laughs> but his other, his other big job was, <laughs> was, 
was to, to uh, measure things that weren't measured in arts lab. And Mike came up with this uh, assay for um, thalamine, which I was really pleased to see. I can't remember who put that on a slide today. It was on a slide today. This is a paleo relaxant for anybody who doesn't remember drugs that have gone away in our dinosaurs. So um, Mike and I went, have, went on to become really close friends. And part of the things that cemented that was Mike got me into Indian guides. And we did that for a couple of years with our sons. This is uh, myself and Patrick on a um, camping weekend. Those were great. Um, this is um, my son, Patrick, sitting next to uh, Mike's son, Joe, and that's Mike Abrams. And I will point out that that says Honor Tribe. We were one of the uh, best uh, tribes in all of Indian guides. And this is, uh, I, I love this picture because I don't know if Mike's seen this, my collection of pictures, but to me, it epitomizes Mike's hands-on approach to parenting. He's down in the dirt with his kid. And it also shows something else that everybody knows Mike knows and that he's a straight shooter. <laughs> And this approach, <laughs> this approach has paid off uh, in spades because this is Joe uh, just a couple of years ago getting the uh, Young uh, Civil Engineer of the Year Award. Um, and it was handed out at the Art Institute of Chicago. And I, I think it's really great that we started there. And for Patrick and I, I got to be at his hooding ceremony as a faculty member at uh, U University of uh, Colorado. So uh, Indian guides start things off. And my daughter, I have a daughter, uh, <laughs> poor thing. Uh, she learned at an early age that if she wanted to spend time with her dad, um, she had to get on a bike. And even if it meant going up Slum Gully and Pass in Colorado uh, on the back of a tandem, pretty brutal. And anyway, but she now has a University of Colorado uh, connection. She's um, a director of academic innovations for the, um, uh, for the system. Oh, where were we? We're talking about um, this. I'm gonna move through this pretty fast. Uh, I, I did wanna, Art also gave me, uh, since I was an expert in, um, dialysis chambers, I, this is how we started this experiment off. I just wanted to show you how grounded we were in physical chemical properties and physiology. This was a, um, a dialysis chamber where we would put both uh, inulin and galamine in here, wait periods of time, take aliquots out of here. This is a sintered glass uh, membrane. And this way you can measure um, diffusion coefficient, and that allows us to uh, express clearance in terms, oops, what did I do? Oh, okay, no problem. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> There's a button here that, <laughs> so I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly because I wanna get to the part that ties into stuff later. This is the, I, I'm, I was endlessly fascinated by this, but I'm not sure you guys will be. <laughs> uh, but basically, uh, inulin and galamine go to the same place, but they go at very different rates. And it has to do with the diffusion coefficient. And that's the ratio between them, meaning in, uh, galamine's five times faster. And we were able to, uh, nail down the, dis the uh, distribution clearance parameters down to the nitty gritty. And I just, <clears throat> this slide is important because uh, one of the things that all of that kind of analysis depends on is that the central volume of distribution is blood or is mostly blood. And we checked that, uh, this is from our estimate of, of central volume corrected for uh, the hematocrit. 
and here's the expected blood volume in the dog experiment that we did. So we were, had the same variability and really kind of were able to measure blood. So we were looking at transcapillary exchange, et cetera. From there, uh, finishing my training, I would, Art arranged for me to go to the Karolinska Institute. Um, and that's where I ran into a PhD student, Lars Gustafson, who later, uh, Talmud, you probably know Lars, he spent time in, um, in Stan at Stanford. And he's a Swedes Swede. Um, for those of you wondering what he's got in his hands, that's a uh, Christmas goat. <laughs> and he made it he, himself just a few minutes before this picture was taken out of straw. And this was back in um, 1983, 1984. And uh, Art had spent a year at, in Stockholm as well. And that was our connection uh, to the Karolinska and uh, Stockholm. The, the year there, it's one of the reasons that we're one of the stalwarts of the department of this organization, as Ken said, that we, uh, we at, in that lab, we had 19, we had people from 19 different countries from every continent. And here's uh, us, a few of us at a, um, um, so it was a very international, very collaborative atmosphere. This, it, they also mandated, everything in Sweden was either forbidden or mandated, in case you didn't know. <laughs> and this, this is the mandated coffee break that we had to take every day. And um, this is at Eddie Spina, an Italian. This is Julio Benitez, we later collaborated with from Spain. And this is Uichi Koki from um, 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 Japan. And my wife during that year uh, spent her days, six hours a day in Swedish assimilation classes. And this is her class. It, it also was equally um, international. And this is the Lucia celebration that they have every December 13th. So she got busy. So <clears throat> this gets us to 1985 after we get back. And Terry Homer and Don Stansky published this really provocative paper that got us uh, moving. And what they showed is that they looked at kinetics and dynamics in young people and older people. I don't say aged, because <laughs> that, that's me now. So they had, here's somebody who's um, 72 and somebody who's um, 32. They ran propofol until they got to, I'm not propofol, thiopental, because it was back in the day. And to an EEG endpoint, they took arterial blood samples during the infusion and after, and then modeled uh, the results. And for us who were used to, all of them should have been close to five liters. But the young ones, for some reason, were much higher. And that was the main difference between the young and the old, was that the young had much larger volumes of distribution. And we wanted to get to the bottom of that one way or the other, because that didn't make sense. But we figured there was a physiologic reason for it. So we spent a lot of time and I'm not going to bore you with uh, too much of it, but this was an important um, time, and it was kind of this this graph over here. So uh, this is where, okay, so we're going to find the physiologic reason. We need somebody who knows something about physiology, and uh, turns out Tom Krejci had just finished his. Uh, <laughs> Had just finished his. Um, yeah, these old pictures are funny. Uh, he'd just finished his uh, fellowship, um, postdoc fellowship in research in the physio physiologic effects of anesthetics. Uh, he also has an engineering background, and uh, so he was perfect uh, for us uh, to add to our group. He was eager to get involved, 
and we really needed him because we were interested in the physiologic uh, basis of pharmacokinetic models. Um, as somebody mentioned earlier, um, the three of us really had a, a close bond. This is the uh, anesthesia SWAT team, that, which is a name that Steve Schaefer stuck on us at a site visit uh, for a program project grant. And, and that was to uh, capture how much data we could get. Um, and some of the components, we'll start with Tom, who was really responsible for all of the aspects of putting the experimental design together and making sure we did the study rigorously. Um, he was also, as we wrote things up, the, what I would call the keeper of real. If you couldn't explain something in common sense language, um, it was out, no hand waving. You had to, <laughs> you had to do it the right way. Um, Mike ran the lab and uh, was in charge of the equipment, the assays, and all the personnel because Tom and I were active clinicians. So we weren't there all the time. And Mike was awesome at that. The other thing about Mike that is, um, oops, is he's a, <laughs> he's a language cop for those. That, so nothing went out of our lab. Uh, that No papers were published that weren't readable. And he's taken that skill now to anesthesiology. Oh, look at the nods. There's nods all over the room. <laughs> you guys all know what I'm talking about. But that really helped communicate what we were, were doing. And what every group also needs, especially a young group like this, is a protector. And that was Harry Lindy. Um, and so Harry was the vice chair for research. Uh, he looked out after us, made sure we had space made sure we had enough time and made sure we had enough money to just be underfunded. <laughs> so we really did everything together lockstep. We planned out all of our work. We worked very closely as a three person team. And just to show you how coordinated we were, we had um, our sons, our firstborn sons all occurred within weeks of each other. That, that's management. <laughs> so our experimental paradigm, for those who haven't seen it, I'm just, this is for historical purposes, mainly is that we would give uh, drug and physiologic markers. Um, example of two physiologic markers we use frequently were endocyanin green because it marked intravascular space and intravascular mixing. We would use antipyrene uh, as um, flow limited diffusion uh, for intercompartmental clearance and also for total body water. And then we'd throw a drug in, uh, in this case, um, lidocaine in this example. Uh, we would also did two things and it's gonna become important later is we gave rapid central venous injection no infusions, drug in within one second. Um, and then we would do a lot of uh, blood samples. And, and when we started these protocols, um, we didn't have a model. So we were like crossing our fingers that we could get this figured out. So this is an example of what our data uh, looked like. This is just one minute of data from ICG. Um, Oh, look, it didn't turn out so hot. Um, the main salient point here is that the data looked really, really good. And it kind of uh, demanded that you would have a model that could fit it. And you can see that we, our model also nails the points almost uncannily. But it was because we had such great data. And it goes back to what Art Atkinson had taught us that it's really the um, science is the triumph of rigor over reason a lot of the time. <clears throat> so this is our basic model construct. Here is the rapid IV injection. Uh, it goes IV, then it, it distributes across the central circulation through the lungs. Here's where we would sample arterially. And then it distributes kind of like any other uh, pharmacokinetic model. 
Uh, one of the other features of this model is that we were able to measure uh, the mean transit time uh, across this uh, distributed um, delay. And it's simply the number of compartments and a number of uh, compartments in the delay and um, divided by the rate constant that's the same one between all of the um, cells. So what, you, what we would get as typical data, just to uh, kind of orient you. Um, so these are normalized blood concentrations. I know what this is. This is, a, this is an apple. Oh, God. <laughs> Okay, um, so uh, so the, uh, once you normalize the blood concentrations, every single one of these curves gives you the cardiac output because they all had a dose, they all have an AUC, a first pass AUC, and they should all give you the exact same number and, and they did. Uh, what's different um, among them is that the mean transit time varies so if you multiply the mean transit time times the cardiac output, that's the volume. So for endocyanin green, that's the blood volume of the heart and lungs. Uh, antipyrene is the blood volume plus the free water in the lung. And then uh, lidocaine here, it's sticking to the lung. So um, that was kind of what we were interested in. We're not gonna go into that, but I just wanted to show you the paradigm. going to switch back to bikes. Uh, <laughs> this is um, the uh, myself and my three brothers. Uh, we did a lot of bike adventures uh, together. Um, we're actually lined up in birth order with uh, me being the oldest. And we did a lot of different bike rides together. But I think the one we're most proud of that we all signed up for, and we all complete completed together. Uh, different times. One of my brothers is really fast. Is we all finished Leadville together, and uh, we were talking last night because um, Ken was saying you get a belt buckle if you finish. Well, that's one of the things that you get. So we all managed to finish it together. That's pretty cool. And a few other people did it uh, use using these models. Um, and that was very uh, gratifying to us. And also to see that they would get the same results we did. And this one's interesting because um, Yetta Kuypers and Eric Olson uh, actually came to Chicago for almost a month uh, to learn the modeling techniques. And this was back in the 90s. And this uh, paper is from 19... Um, um, <clears throat> 99, and uh, it has some of our old friends from uh, ISAP, uh, Fred Boer, uh, Anton Berm, and of course, a dear friend to all of us, uh, Jim Bovo, who was the head of research in, at Leiden for quite a while. And just to show I wasn't kidding, they actually did measure, <laughs> at, at, they, they actually gave ICG at the same time, did roughly the same kind of experiment and were able to model uh, successfully and, and did a nice job. So then I kind of get the uh, kind of doldrums for a lot of time, a lot of time because I was the uh, department chair uh, at the University of Colorado for about 16 years. Um, a couple of things I was able to keep going. One was the journal club format that Mike, uh, Tom and I had uh, devised at, at Northwestern, we kept that going. And one of the residents came to me in the early 2000s and said, I got a paper, it's not a clinical paper, we always do clinical papers, but I've got a paper that I want you to do. And it turned out he had an MD, PhD in neuroscience. And he, it was this paper, uh, which we all heard about uh, this morning. This was one of the first ones that Vesna published uh, that was really comprehensive. And it was really the, what set everything going. Um, and um, I was also during these years, not only with, with the, the, that journal club, but because of this journal club, and I was the program chair for ISAP for a couple of years. And I said, you know, we need to move a little bit away from just SIVA themes and into more 
pharmacology, and I thought this was the perfect example of something that we should do. And I don't know if you guys remember, but we had many years ago, we had Vesna and her mentor, John Olney, um, here as speakers. So I stayed, of course, very interested in ISAP, and it was fun to watch, um, not fun to watch as I was, but to see that this idea of getting a little bit away from SIVO was paying off. Um, Vesna became a program chair, and here she is with Mohammed Magib. We just had the Magib uh, uh, lecture. Uh, and they had organized a session on Alzheimer's and who shows up but somebody from Art Atkinson's class, uh, Vlad Effinghoff. So uh, what goes around comes around. And Vesna stayed on uh, very active in the organization. And as you know, I'm here every year and it really uh, helped to get her interested in the University of Colorado and maybe that she should be my replacement as chair. And it happened, <laughs> of course. Uh, she's now our chair. This is our this month's uh, newsletter that she puts out. Uh, she calls it Airways. It's really great. And um, so I was able to hook her, get her into the department. And oh, oh it didn't show up. Anyway. What I was going, what well, should have been there was ISAP was the bait. <laughs> so once she arrived in 2016, I could leave and go do a sabbatical and kind of catch up on what I'd been missing out on. And one of the things I wanted to do was learn systems pharmacology. And so I contacted Pete Vandergraaff, who was at Leiden University at the time. He said, sure, come on out, I'd be happy to have you. Um, but, and also at the same time, I wanted to get uh, acquainted with population uh, PK and um, uh, Albert uh, Dahan and Eric Olson said, no, we'll, we'll supply you with all of that and even give you an office. So this is uh, Leiden. It's um, about midway between uh, Amsterdam and The Hague. And it doesn't always look like this. Um, this is kind of what it looks like <laughs> a lot of the time. This is the medical center. And my office was uh, right smack in the middle of the medical center in a windowless cubbyhole. But they, they took good care of me. Um, and the project they wanted me to do was, and it would be a great way to learn population PK, was to take all of their ketamine data. And they had a lot of ketamine studies and do kind of a large um, population analysis. And this uh, is something that I, I, I love Michelle uh, has said that what this actually is, is a data level meta-analysis. And just to give you an idea of what uh, was um, the data that they had, they had, um, they had dense data from uh, several studies where they had arterial sampling and lots of samples over uh, like a day, but they also had some chronic ones where they had uh, studies for multiple days where they had venous blood samples and sparser data. And um, so I took that and tried to learn, um, get out a manual and figure out how to, um, oops, that button again learn non-mem and they handed me this. So I think anybody who's done non-mem, I can see the smile, it's, it's horrible, especially when you're in your late sixties to be presented with this thing. And this is part five that really goes into population PK. And um, uh, Eric, bless his heart, said, no, you're gonna read this. And not only that, you're gonna read a chapter a day and you're gonna come and explain it to me. So that was my job was to go through uh, the non-mem manual and explain it to an expert every day and look like a fool. <laughs> but one of the things that tickled me is uh, when I'm going through it is uh, 
I got reacquainted with Theophilin because he had a Theophilin model in there. So it, it all worked out. The problem that we had was that he had a lot of arterial data and some venous data and the two didn't go together. They, and especially since they were out of balance, you couldn't really figure it out because they had so much arterial data and it was overshadowing the venous data. The venous data was just getting swallowed. So I went out trying to find kinetic studies that had um, um, venous data in it. Oh, I keep hitting this button, sorry. <clears throat> and one of the ones we found was from um, the Karolinska and had Lars Gustafson as one of the authors. And um, this got published back in, let's look at 2002. So it was old data, uh, but it, he had Venus data and I reached out to him and asked him if he would send the data to Leiden. And within a day, uh, he had um, Jan Persson uh, send me the data and it was all handwritten. <laughs> I know all you were thinking, oh yeah, you just load it up and run it. No, it wasn't that easy. And their experiment, and I, and I blame Steve and maybe Talmadge and anybody who'd been at Stanford uh, for this, but it really turned out to be a great blessing is um, they did, well, first of all, they injected on separate occasions, the SN enantiomer and the R enantiomer on separate, it, they, 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 they form, formulated both and they did arterial and venous. And I asked Lars, I said, why did you do both? And he said, well, it was at Stanford. It seemed like a good idea. Because <laughs> at Stanford, you do arterial and at, at Clem Farm in, um, in at Karolinska, they do venous. So he said, I'll just do both. So they collected both sets of data, which turned out to really be kind of a boon for this next, this next thing. So we ended up doing a paper that had uh, for an analysis that had all uh, four places that I had been, which was kind of cool. So they had me who at the University of Colorado, um, had Mike and Tom, uh, were involved in this. What they were able to do is add the recirculatory pieces to it. Uh, Albert and Eric got this off the ground and kind of I did my preliminary modeling with them and they were hugely helpful. And then of course, uh, we have the Karolinska and with uh, Lars and Jan bringing their stuff in. So their data is kind of interesting um, because uh, if you look, uh, the red's the arterial. During the infusion, the arterial levels are way higher than the venous blood levels. Turn the infusion off and they basically come together. And then after some time passes, notice the scale change. This isn't that big of a difference, but the venous is consistently higher than the arterial, which is kind of interesting. So that led to uh, our model. And there's some interesting points here. And that is the, the drug is injected into what uh, is an unmixed volume. It's not fully mixed. It hasn't been to the central volume of distribution yet. And it produces an arterial concentration that is constituted of both the central volume concentration plus this unmixed concentration. And the unmixed concentration, because this volume is very small, it's only about a liter, but you're only talking about the lung. The unmixed concentration is basically the drug infusion rate uh, divided by the cardiac output. So we got pretty excited about this. Uh, we're preparing the manuscript and uh, Eric writes me an email and says, uh, not so fast. Somebody else has probably said the same thing. And it turns out <laughs> Richard Upton, one of our old buddies uh, at, from uh, Adelaide had published um, a couple of articles talking about recirculatory pharmacokinetics and he wanted to make it simple. It's not a simple paper, believe me, uh, from Richard uh, it, as a two compartment model um, and to get these kind of recirculatory concepts um, uh, down and introduced. 
And these are two of his equations and his two compartments was the, a lung compartment, which was our unmixed. So he called it lung and the central compartment, which is the rest of the body. Uh, he, he kept it to two. But those two, those two volumes produced three concentrations. Uh, it produced an arterial concentration and a central concentration, but also this unmixed concentration, which in his nomenclature was the infusion rate divided by all the currency, which is basically the cardiac output. And it's just to show you the differences between us, which were really not differences, that we're talking the same thing, and um, especially that part. And I liked, I would tease uh, Eric uh, about this and Albert, and they didn't like it. Um, but I was like, I call that concentration the mixing artifact. So anytime you're taking arterial samples, you've got artifact. Um, they were like, no, no, we don't. <laughs> so I'm going to explain this in kind of a different way. Um, uh, what this kind of feels like in real life. This is uh, me and my youngest brother. Uh, he got me into doing triathlons. This is us doing a triathlon together at the transition. Um, and one of the things you do, this is Lake Geneva, which is in southeast Wisconsin. And one of the things you do is um, you have to do open water swims. And that's a different animal than swimming in a, in a, in a um, swimming pool. So you have to get used to it. And one of the things about Southeast Wisconsin is they've got a lot of cold water, fresh water springs that just bubble up out of the ground. And in fact, there was, uh, this is an interesting thing. If anybody's read Devil in the White City will know about this war between Waukesha, Wisconsin and, um, and Chicago World's Fair of uh, 1892. And basically, uh, Chicago had typhoid in the water. So it was not good to have a World's Fair with typhoid. And there was like perfect water just north in Wisconsin. So they wanted to build a pipe that would pipe the water from Wisconsin to the World's Fair. And it didn't happen. Uh, but they were able to bottle it up and bring it down in trains. They did consent to that. And there's a lot of springs. I mean. Um, some of the names are kind of fun, like you could be in paradise with the spring, um, you could be petrified with the spring, you can be uh, scuppered with the spring. And, but the other thing is there's lakes and the place where, uh, because of uh, my wife, her family had a cottage on this lake, we still go there twice a year, uh, meet up with Tom Krejci there when we go, is uh, Pleasant Lake is spring fed. Uh, it's got 15, I think 17 springs come in to the lake and keep it uh, fresh. Um, so this is where, this is why I did all this triathlon stuff. <laughs> the spring is the drug infusion. So think of that as that's coming in. As you're swimming across, you're gonna feel a cold jet. That's the unmixed arterial blood. That's not, the, that's not the infusion, that's the unmixed arterial blood. And if you keep swimming just a few strokes, you'll be back in nice water and that's VC. So um, you can kind of, <laughs> so to go over this uh, very quickly, uh, what we saw when we sim simulate our model and it's important here. So right here is the ketamine infusion rate. That's this gray line. This is the arterial blood. This is a VC, the yellow one. This orange line is the concentration that's produced by the cardiac output and the infusion rate. So that's why the venous, uh, the uh, arterial is so much larger during the infusion. After the infusion, it goes away. So I'm gonna ask a couple of questions. Um, first one is, you don't have to raise your hand or answer, but um, if the unmixed blood is infusion divided by the cardiac output, what happens in low cardiac output states? 
the arterial blood concentrations go sky, not sky high, but proportionately higher. And there's a corollary to that question. And the corollary question, so if that happens, what happens to contact sensitivity if you're measuring it from arterial blood in low cardiac output states? So if you suddenly remove the unmixed, when you turn off the infusion, which is what contact sensitivity is all about, you run an infusion for X amount of time, turn it off, what happens? You're gonna lose that unmixed and you're uh, in low cardiac output states, you're going to have low, uh, short contact sensitive half time. So um, we put that in the paper, but we didn't have any data to support it because we only had the one experiment, but ISAP strikes again. Uh, this is Jürgen Schuttler, who I think everybody will remember. He's been here many, many times and was a regular for quite a while. This paper was published at about the same time as our paper. And it's the influence of cardiac output on the pharmacokinetics of sufentanil in anesthetized pigs. And uh, guess what a graph he made? He did the, he did the context sensitive half time. He's calling them 50% decrement, which is fine because he did the other ones as well. And he did it for the um, low cardiac output state, the ones where the pigs were kind of not modified in any way, and then the ones where they boosted their cardiac output really high. And his co their comment about this was that um, after a, after a three hour infusion, they uh, simulated context sensitive half life for our half time. I don't I shouldn't say half life uh, for a um, cardiac output of seven liters per minute was eight times longer than that for the low cardiac output state. And he said that's surprising because one would expect intuitively until you actually do it, um, that you would expect a more rapid decrease if you had a high cardiac output, but that's not the case because you're removing that unmixed portion that goes away very quickly. So that brings us all the way back to uh, Homer and Stansky in 1985. And remember we were focused over here, but now I wanna draw your attention to the graph on the other side and since they were running infusions, what was the contact sensitivity in the old versus the young? You can see that they were, went to the basically the same concentration during the infusion. And how long does it take? How fast did they drop after? Well, the older one with maybe a lower cardiac output uh, dropped much farther and much faster than the, um, the young subject. So, these ideas don't go away. <laughs> and these were arterial, and I kind of wish to, 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 it would be fun to reanalyze that data with a recirculatory model. So one of the things that, going back to the right-hand side, one of the things that's interesting is they actually recruited a patient who was 90 years old, uh, which is really pretty awesome. So I'm like, what does that look like? Well, I had the answer because um, this spring, my mother had her 90th birthday. And <laughs> so here's my mom um, with her uh, four bike riding son and our non-bike riding um, daughter, our sister, sister, it's her daughter. And so that's what 90 looks like. And uh, this is the rest of our clan la earlier this month at, um, the uh, Spider-Man, uh, it's his birthday, this is Oscar, he's the Spider-Man on the right, this is um, Colette, who's this, the Spider-Man over on the left, and um, that's our family in Denver, and that's the end of my talk, and thanks to everybody.